Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. Let's look at the rest of the small intestines. We've spoken about the duodenum, the first 25 centimeters. Let's now talk about the rest of this big, big six meter long tube. It's broken up into two parts, that of the jejunum and the ileum. Now if I take this big six meter long tube, what you'll find is at the very first segment, that's where the duodenum was found, again 25 centimeters. And at the end, that's where you'd find the first part of the large intestines called the cecum. But in between, that's where the jejunum and ileum lie. The first two fifths of this big long six meter tube is the jejunum. And the last three fifths is that of the ileum, which means the ileum is obviously the longest portion of the small intestines. The jejunum is 2.4 meters long and the ileum is 3.6 meters long. Now if we were to take a look at the hollow inside of these tubes, so the lumen of these two tubes, there are some similarities and there are some differences. Remember, all the way through the GIT you're going to have those same four layers. From internal to external you're going to have the mucosa, then the submucosa, then the muscularis externa, and then you go and have the serosa or adventitia. Now you can see here that the serosa and adventitia is termed mesentery here. This is what is holding these hollow tubes, this big long six meter tube to the dorsal body cavity and that's termed mesentery. All right. Now as we have a look, you can see the longitudinal layer and the circular layer of the muscularis for both. Then you can see the mucosa and submucosal layer here and you can see that you've got all these multiple folds that we term villi. And both the jejunum and the ileum have villi, however the villi are more pronounced than the jejunum. You find that from the duodenum to the jejunum you have very pronounced villi that we term plicae circularis and then as we continue to move through the small intestines they begin to diminish by the time we get to large intestines you'll find they're basically absent another thing that you'll find is within this submucosa you have these areas of dense lymphoid tissue so they're there for immune function called pyres patches and you'll see the pyres patches basically only in the ileum. You don't really find them in, in the jejunum and you don't really find them in the duodenum either. Again, they're there for an immune role. Now, if we have a look at basically the histology, the cells, the tissues, and you have a look at the folds. So here you can see you've got the villi, but you've also got some glands or crypts. Now these crypts are called crypts of Lieberkuhn and there's multiple different cell types within them. I'll talk about that in a sec. But the two most pronounced cell types within the small intestines, so that's all of this jejunum and ileum, is that of the absorptive enterocytes. So this is the most common cell type of the small intestines. Now, these absorptive enterocytes, they are simple, so one layer, columnar, long, and they have microvilli on the ends of them. Microvilli are like small villi, they're fingertip like projections. Every single absorptive enterocyte has about 3,000 microvilli on them. And again, they're there to help increase the absorptive capacity. The second most common type of cell is that of the goblet cell, and they produce mucus. Okay, so goblet cells play a really important role in lubricating that area and protecting it from mechanical damage, and also from protecting it from invading pathogens as well. Now you can also see that as we move down, now I'll talk about the glands and crypts in a second, but as we move down into the submucosa, where we have the blood vessels, the nerve fibers, and the lymphatics, that I've drawn the lymphatics in here. Now the small intestines have lymph vessels, these blunt-ended lymph vessels that go up into these villi, and this is important because when these absorptive villi absorb, remember, they're gonna be absorbing the micronutrients that have now been broken down from the macronutrients, proteins, fats, carbs, right? So carbs are gonna be broken down into glucose, fructose, so forth. Proteins are gonna be broken down into amino acids, and fats are gonna be broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. Now, these triglycerides, these fats, glycerol, fatty acids, they actually get absorbed here at the lymphatics. Right? The rest get absorbed into the blood vessels, but the fat gets absorbed into the lymphatics. That's very important. Now, as we go into these glands or crypts of Lieberkuhn, there's a couple of different cell types. One, you've got enterocytes. Now, these enterocytes aren't the absorptive kind. They secrete ions, and these ions can be sodium, potassium, magnesium, chloride, calcium, but they also secrete alkaline fluid. This alkaline fluid is really important to stop any uh, acid that's coming through potentially from the stomach from breaking down the intestines. Now you've also got mucus cells. These mucus cells are actually very similar to the goblet cells. So they play a very important role to protect us from microbial uh, invaders. And panath cells, 
Now these palate cells are also very important. They also play an antimicrobial role. So they release lysosomes, for example, tumor necrosis factor, all these types of very important chemicals that help kill off any bacteria or invading pathogens that should not be there. And then the last one is those are the neuroendocrine cells I've spoken about in the stomach. They release chemicals, which can also be hormones, and they play very important roles in the body. In this case, the neuroendocrine cells of the small intestines can release gastrin, which promotes digestion in the stomach. CCK, which is cholecystokinin, it stimulates the gallbladder to contract and push bile into the small intestines. And secretin, which stimulates the pancreas to release various enzymes and ions and fluids and all these types of things. So this is a quick run through of the jejunum and ileum.